So before I talk about atom interferometry, I better talk about regular interferometry, and that's usually done with light. Uh, so the essential idea is that although light seems to be just a steady stream of, uh, of photons or even just some sort of electromagnetic field, in fact, light is really a wave. Like uh, ocean waves, the, the key characteristic is that if you have two waves that come along, sometimes the peaks of one add into the peaks of the other, and then the waves are much higher, or sometimes the, the high points on one add into the low points on the other, and, and you have very little excitation of the water, even though you can see that there are two waves coming in that direction. And so any, any sailor, like myself, knows that when you're out sailing, you go look for the big waves and try to get your boat planing down on the big waves. Whenever you have waves, and the waves can, are differentiated by coming in different directions, even in the ocean, just slightly different directions, there are places where there are big waves and where there are small waves. And that's basically the interferometer, the interference. Now, in a laser interferometer, you typically have the laser beam come in, it hits a mirror that has only some silver on it, so some of the laser beam bounces off and some of it goes straight through. You put some more laser beams so that these two beams go this way, then they come back together, and where they come back together here, they interfere and they make fringes. Now, the key point about the fringes is that they're sensitive to what goes on in these two separate paths to a very, very high degree. So if I take this mirror here and I move it just a quarter of a wavelength of light, so that's about a tenth of a micron, then the pattern over here will shift. Where it was light, it will be dark, and where it was dark, it will be light. And so if you have something that's measuring where that where those uh, interference fringes are, you can make it a very, very accurate measurement of, of the displacement of this mirror, uh, and that's an interferometric measurement. If uh, you believe quantum mechanics, then everything's a wave. All atoms are a wave, too. And so the question comes, well, can the atom come along, can you make something where the atom comes along, hits the analog of a, of a mirror, of a, of a half-silvered mirror and goes two different paths and comes together and interferes over here. And you don't have to be that great a physicist to realize, oh, this would be tremendously sensitive to the motion over here of whatever, the, the, or, or to some interaction that the atom had. Maybe it went through a magnetic field that was bigger here or there, or it went through an electric field, and th that would shift the fringes. And the atom wavelength is about of a typical room temperature atom out of, a, out of just a sodium oven, you know, a little can filled up with sodium and heated so that the sodium comes out the little hole, uh, the wavelength of the atoms coming out there is about 10,000 times less than the wavelength of light. So this, an instrument made in which atoms interfere could be thousands of times or hundreds of times more sensitive than the, the kind of sensitive measurements you can already make with, uh, with photons, with, with lasers. Uh, now, that's the good news. The bad news is we don't, at least until we had Bose-Einstein condensates, we didn't have any sources of, of coherent atoms, like the coherent photons that come out of a laser. But nevertheless, even with just a sodium oven, we persevered and we made an atom interferometer. And, uh, so I guess the first thing you'll be curious about is how did you do that? Because you, if you take a piece of a, a mirror here, uh, atoms don't go through glass. So you can't use something that's, that's uh, solid. Well, you can use uh, a laser beam, uh, a certain kind of laser beam. We actually use something called a diffraction grating, which is uh, we got from some people here at MIT, Hank Smith's group, that, that does nanofabrication. And this was a transmission grating. It really consisted of a series of gold bars like this that were uh, separated by about a quarter of a light wavelength of light. So it was really, really small. You can't see that with a microscope. No, no optical microscope can see the, the things because they're so much smaller than a wavelength. But anyway, when the atoms go through these, 
they, have, they then split into going in several different directions. So we, uh, we, we took the atom beam and it went through one of these gratings and it split into two directions. And then we took a couple more of these gratings and used the ones that came back together. And then we had an atom interferometer where the interference fringes were formed up here and the atoms started down here. So then the question arose is, well, what can you do with it? Um, and the answer is you can do all sorts of things. And so, in fact, this was one of the great times in my scientific career when we had the only instrument in the world where the atoms were separated enough going through that we could put a metal sheet in between. You're thinking of the atom as being on one side or the other of this sheet. But unless you make a measurement, quantum mechanics says no, the atom is represented by a wave and the wave is going both ways and coming back together. And that's the only reason that you can see the interference pattern over here is because of the possibility of the atom going this way or that. You didn't look. Okay, so now, um, what can we do that's, that, what well, can we uh, utilize the sensitivity of the atoms? Well, one of the things we did was when we had this metal sheet here, we, we put an electric field over here on one side, but not on the other side. But when the atoms went through the electric field, they have a property called polarization. Polarizability is a, is a number characterizing the, the ability that you can, electric field can pull the electron away from the center of the atom. The atom in going through the electric field would get uh, accelerated or decelerated a little bit or would have its energy changed so that it would shift the fringes. And that's a very sensitive uh, measure of the interaction with the electric field. And so we were able to measure the polarizability uh, about 20 times better than it had been measured before. And of course, at that time, there were maybe 25 or 30 different theories of, of how to calculate the polarizability. And there we had a definitive measurement, so we were able to determine which, cal which calculations work best and which type of calculation worked best. Another thing that we did was to uh, put uh, a gas on one side of the, um, of the metal plate, but not on the other. Now, normally you think, well, there's a gas there, so the sodium, the atoms in the interferometer will just come and bounce off the gas molecules, they will hit it, and that will be the end of them. And yes, that does happen. But the gas also acts like a piece of glass for an optical wave, and it changes, there's a slight interaction that changes the wavelength of the, of the waves going through the gas, and so we were able to measure what is for optical glass called the index of refraction, that we were able to measure the index of refraction of an atomic gas for an atom wave. And of course, there's some theories for that. And again, we could make some measurements there. So when you have an atom interferometer, the atoms spend some time going through the interferometer. And if the interferometer were to rotate during that time, the atoms that were traveling through it wouldn't know that the atom interferometer rotated. And so what you would see is that the fringes would appear for the detector to be in the wrong place. And the faster the atom interferometer rotates, the farther the fringes would shift. So you could use atom interferometers as a sensor for rotation, or you can use them as a sensor for atoms falling. Namely, you could expect the interference pattern to be here, but because there's gravity, the atoms would actually be pulled down, and so you'd see the, uh, the fringes down low, at lower. Now remember, you can make these fringes positions very, very precise, you e either with this fabricated uh, grating that we used or by using light waves. And so when you work out all the numbers, atom interferometers turn out to be wonderful sensors of inertial motion, of motion in space. So. Uh, there was a big uh, program uh, funded by the military uh, called Precision Inertial Navigation. And the idea was to use atom interferometers, uh, both to sense gravity uh, or to sense acceleration and also to sense direction. And the challenge was, uh, I will make a box and I will put some atom interferometers in it. and I will tell you that this box, I will tell the box that it's parked in a Jeep. 
and now the Jeep will just drive off and will drive all around for an hour. And then the box will tell you where you are because every time the Jeep started, it said, oh, we're accelerating in that direction. And then when the Jeep turned, it said, oh, now we're going that way. And now we slowed down, but it just adds up the velocity, adds up the rotation. And uh, the goal uh, was to know where, you, where the, the Jeep was within 30, no, within uh, 10 meters after an hour. Completely independent of the global transition, you know, the global positioning system, or what route the, the Jeep went, or whether it went up and down hills, or whatever. So that's just an example of the kind of sensitivity that atom interferometers have. And uh, I suppose it's probably a military secret now whether you can really build such a box and, and make it work. But my suspicion is that it's possible to do that, but that it's probably right now a little bit uh, too expensive. So I see two futures for atom interferometers that are, are very intriguing and interesting at the present time. The first one is measuring fundamental constants, just the fact that the atoms are so, and atom interferometers are so sensitive that we can measure things like the recoil velocity of an atom when a, pho a single photon hits it. And this will enable us to determine things like the charge on the electron and, and other basic parameters, maybe the fine structure constant, we can determine them better. Uh, and the second thing, which is a little bit more interesting to me, is probing the nature of quantum mechanics. So we started doing this a little bit by shining light on the atom as it went through and, and showing that when the atom had, with the two paths the atom could take had diverged sufficiently that we were able to resolve with a microscope which way it, it went, then there were no more fringes. But if we didn't look at the photon and then we post-selected the atoms that had uh, scattered the photon in one direction, we got the, the fringes back. So this is getting at the fundamental question of when do things act like atoms, when do things act like waves, how can we change this, how can we retroactively change the system's mind about which it was, uh, and what is reality, what is the nature of reality. All these are questions, are fundamental questions of quantum mechanics, and atom interferometers will certainly play an important role in elucidating them. <laughs>